We stand in need of good news, and I'm particularly pleased to get to share it with you this morning. You know, when Jesus traveled around preaching the gospel and ministering to people, village after village, town after town, what he ran into were crowds full of distressed and dispirited people. Now, before we get all chronologically snobbish on them and think, well, that was those people... Uh, I'm sure they had the outside intact, and I'm sure everybody thought things were good, and they said, oh, how are you doing good? And all that. But, but what Jesus, who could see what was in a man, saw was distressed and dispirited people, like sheep without a shepherd. And as I consider that statement, I think it sounds pretty familiar. I see a lot of tired. Sometimes we even greet one another that way. How are you doing? Tired. <laughs> Stressed out. Bored, unfulfilled, apathetic, anxious, aimless like sheep without a shepherd. And into that Jesus brought good news. You know, the truth is that, uh, you know, it may, it may be in some other buildings, it may be in other places, uh, it might not be in here today, but I'm quite sure that there are people this morning who woke up on Easter Sunday 2018 and uh, you know, you ask them, do, do you believe uh, the, the gospel of Jesus? And the answer is going to be yes. Have you heard these things? Yes, I have. Do you, do you think they're true? Yes, I have. But, but if we're honest with ourselves, the truth is that we woke up this morning, some of us very far from God. We don't know how we got there. We're not entirely sure how to get from there. But we woke up this morning very far from God. And again, into that, I bring good news. We find today in this passage that Paul, the apostle, delivered good news as of first importance. And that's an important thing to recognize. That awareness is different from priority. Isn't it? The gospel is a matter of first importance. I believe that the failure to experience the power of the gospel among so many who have heard it Yes, even would say, I believe it, is precisely the fact that they have merely heard it. Awareness is different than priority. On this Easter Sunday morning, it is time for us to come back and to put the gospel in its place, to first importance. And when we do that, each one of us, we will find its redemptive power coursing through every other aspect of our lives. Brothers and sisters, this Easter Sunday, it's time to remember the story. It's time to reconsider things and it's time to respond. Let's go to the scripture now in verse 1 of chapter 15. The apostle writes, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. Do you see how much hangs on this news? Everything hangs on this news. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. By the way, that statement, that last sentence that I read, in the time that it was written, it was an invitation to those who were hearing these things. You understand there are witnesses, there are many of them. You can go seek them out. Many of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of heralding the good news this morning that Jesus Christ came, died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. I pray that you would inhabit this this feeble and uh, frail offering that human flesh can put forward and that your word and the truth of it would ring clear in this place and that you'd give us ears to hear it and eyes to see it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
We begin this morning remembering, remembering that 2,000 years ago, in the fullness of time, a light came into the world. This was the true light, the light that shines even in deepest darkness, the light into which, if a man comes, he himself will be enlightened. His birth was proclaimed by angels who announced good news of great joy for all people. Because the Savior of the world, Christ the Lord, was born. He, the eternal God, the uncreated creator, the I am, became flesh. He was born of a virgin and he dwelt among us. He showed us the glory of God. He taught us truth, beauty, and righteousness. He confounded the wise. He became known as a friend of publicans and sinners. And he blessed the children. He loved the unlovely. He had compassion on the marginalized. And he had mercy on the sinner. Because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Though he was the king of heaven, he did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Though no evil was found in him, he was assigned a grave with the accursed. He was betrayed. He was mocked. He was scourged. And he was crucified. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. And so it was that life himself died. It was a ghastly scene. Crucifixion was designed for humiliation, for desecration, for agonizing, punitive, endless seemingly suffering until ultimately its victim expired in death. There was a sign that was affixed above him. It read, this is the king of the Jews. The sign was hung there as a form of mockery so that any passerby might understand that there is no king but Caesar. And yet that sign, that precious inscription, stands to this day an everlasting testament to the fact that there is no king like Jesus. The crowds cried, crucify! And their leaders witnessed the death of the one they called a troublemaker, a revolutionary, a blasphemer, one whose death they said was expedient for the nation. And interspersed among them, hardly noticed, those few followers of Jesus who knew him as Lord saw truth and justice abandoned on that tree as the only innocent one hung under the condemnation of the guilty. They saw the depths of human hate as violent men murdered the one who came to give life everlasting and abundant. They saw the shameful desecration of the holy of holies as his viciously beaten and torn body hung naked at eye level on a hill for the whole world to see. They saw the end of that hope which had so transformed them, and yes, they despaired. They took his broken and his bloodied body down from the cross. They hurried it to a nearby tomb where he was buried according to Jewish custom. The tomb was sealed. A guard was set. And all was silent as that day passed into night and into the next day. 
and into the dawn of the third day. When the earth began to shake, as an angel of the Lord rolled the stone away from the mouth of the tomb before the terrified eyes of the women who'd come seeking his grave and the guards who stood defending it, not to let Jesus out, but to show the world good news of great joy for all people. He is not here. He is risen. In the next hours, their joy was mingled with much doubt and confusion. But as Luke records, over a period of 40 days, Jesus presented himself alive after his sufferings by many convincing proofs. And he explained the significance of his death and resurrection as he recalled them to the scriptures and all the things that he taught them concerning the kingdom of God. And finally, before his ascension back to the Father, he promised them the Holy Spirit and commissioned them to go and to preach this good news. (laughs) Proclaiming forgiveness of sins. An everlasting life in his name until he should return again. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried. And he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, we need to remember this good news. Now this morning I'm convinced that we need to do more than remember this news I'm convinced we need to reconsider things. And the reason that I say that is that we have in our times great questions about the truth and significance of this thing that we celebrate here today. We have in our culture a need to think again about the truth of the gospel because a massive cultural shift is taking place. And it is a shift that is eating away the soul of our nation and working as a powerful anti-gospel among our youngest generations. One study found that 51% of teenaged Christians, let's sink in for a minute, 51% of teenaged Christians do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Now before we wrangle about what that means about those particular Christians, Let me say that what I think that it means is that when we look in our churches, unbeknownst to us and much to our shock, if we were to look into our student ministries and we say this is the next generation of the church, the sad reality is this is half the next generation of the church. And it's also half the next generation of atheists. Now I could pile on statistics, but I want to cut to the chase. A modern myth has grown up to towering proportions in our culture, especially in the powerfully influential secularized institutions of government, media, and academia. And the myth is this, that science has proven, or as some will allow, almost proven. We just need to mop a few things up. Science has proven that there is no God, no supernatural, no miracles. All that exists may be reduced to physics and chemistry, matter and energy. And so as it turns out, this Easter celebration we're participating in is much ado about nothing. Now, the most important and successful move the proponents of this myth have made is to drum into the popular understanding that science and religion or science and faith or science and Christianity or science and Jesus' resurrection, science and the gospel are in conflict. One must choose, they say. Now, I believe that Oxford mathematician and philosopher of science, Dr. John Lennox, gets to the heart of the issue when he says, there is a real conflict But it is not science versus religion. It is theism versus atheism. And there are top level scientists on both sides. But here's the kicker. Here's the difficulty because of the milieu in which we live. Many people 
sadly including some Christians, believe that those top-level scientists who are, for example, Christian, are simply importing unscientific religious claims into their worldview while others have come to their atheism by purely scientific and rational means. Brothers and sisters, this is not true. This is a mistake, and it's an important mistake. It's a far-reaching mistake. Now, in a moment, I'm going to talk a bit about, I'm going to use an example from one of Stephen Hawking's, uh, I think it's his last popular book, his last popular um, work. And I want to be clear that in the things that I say, that nothing that we're going to say is to take anything away from the rare genius of Stephen Hawking. He was a rare genius, an incredible person who persevered for decades with a very debilitating disease and contributed marvels to our understanding of the way that this universe works. But Stephen Hawking is not God. So Lennox takes up the late Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design, to show just how little science has to do with Hawking's atheism. One of the central claims of Hawking's book is that, quote, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist, it is not necessary to invoke God, end quote. Lennox responds, quote, it is seldom that one finds in a single statement two distinct levels of contradiction. But Hawking appears to have constructed such a statement. He says the universe comes from nothing, a nothing that turns out to be a something, namely a quantum vacuum. Self-contradiction number one. And then he says that the universe creates itself. Right? Instead of explaining how X came from nothing, Hawking has asserted that X came from X. Self-contradiction number two. Lennox adds, what all this goes to show is that nonsense remains nonsense even when it is spoken by world-famous scientists. What serves, and this is so important, please hone in on, on what he's saying here. What serves to obscure the illogicality of such statements is the fact that they are made by scientists and the general public not surprisingly assumes that they are statements of science and takes them on authority that is why it is important to point out that they are not statements of science and any statement whether made by a scientist or not should be open to logical analysis immense prestige and authority does not compensate for faulty logic now why in the world did I spend precious moments of our Easter Sunday morning here? Why does this matter? The reason that this matters is that it is on the basis of fallacious testimony like this that many people, especially among our younger generations, have bet against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact is that ideas have consequences. And when powerful people with authority promote bad ideas it's all the worse are you betting that there is no God are you betting that there there was no resurrection of Jesus Christ because of some vague notion that it is unscientific to do so I urge you to reconsider Now, one might say, okay, Justin, perhaps science, maybe that's a little bit of overreach. Perhaps the scientists have stepped out of their authority and they've delved into philosophy that they're ill-equipped for, maybe so. But what evidence is there that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened? Please understand that my comments here must be only an introduction. They, they must be brief. And by the way, this summer, uh, during this, the... Uh, the summer months after Memorial Day. Our pastor will uh, suspend his Roman series and take a break until the fall. And during the course of the summer uh, term, some of the Ed staff will be 
uh, on Sunday nights, we'll be doing a series in Christian worldview, what it is that Christians really believe, what is the biblical and the rational basis for the things that we believe. I would encourage you to avail yourself of that. We will cover things like this in much greater detail. And so please join us for that. But as I've mentioned, my comments here are an introduction, and there are three uncontested facts. What I mean by that is that there are three historical facts that no historian of any ideological persuasion disputes. And the facts are these. One, that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified by the Roman government. Two, that shortly thereafter his disciples had experiences that led them to conclude that he had been resurrected. And three, that the foremost and disbelieving persecutor of the fledgling church, Saul of Tarsus, had a similar kind of experience that led him to believe in Jesus' resurrection. Now again, I impress upon you, these are not the only historical data that we could bring to bear. I brought these because they are three that are uncontested by historians of any ideological persuasion. And now let's think for a moment about just the beginnings of the significance of these facts. First, century Jew, first century Jews, Palestinian Jews, okay, in the heartland of their ancestral faith. First century Palestinian Jews of all people on the planet most vehemently con- con- committed to the idea that there is one transcendent God began worshiping a crucified man as God and claiming that this was no departure from their ancient faith. They began to worship not on the Sabbath, but on the Lord's day in honor of this great event. They spoke of sharing in his body and in his blood They suffered ostracism, torture, and death, not in one moment, but for decades, and never wavered in their unbelief. And here's the thing, parents. Not only did they suffer those things, they watched the people they love suffer those things. And here's what I know about that. It is utterly improbable that these people did this for something that they had doubts about much less that they knew to be a lie. Their opponents were unable to produce Jesus' body, nor were they able by any other means to successfully contradict their claims, not to mention prophecies fulfilled and the explosive growth of the church, despite the fact that in these earliest days of the church in the first century, these Christians were a despised and politically powerless minority. These facts demand an explanation. And one was given by multiple independent witnesses. The clear superiority of the resurrection hypothesis. If you don't a priori say resurrections don't happen because science says so. Because you have a prior commitment to naturalism. The resurrection hypothesis in terms of typical measures of historical veracity over other later hypotheses, swoon theory, mass hallucination, stolen body, hoax, legend, lie, shows that historical inquiry strengthens rather than diminishes the Christian claim. And so I ask, are you betting against the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I urge you to reconsider. Now we come to good news. Let's reconsider things as it relates to the significance of his resurrection. Go back with me to the scripture in verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, the good news, which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. What is the significance of Jesus' resurrection? The first piece of significance is that Jesus' resurrection says that the gospel has substance. 
Romans 1, 4 says that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now what does that mean? What it means is that Jesus' resurrection validates his identity and thus his life and thus his teachings and thus the atoning efficacy of his death. Brothers and sisters, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that Christ really did die for our sins. It means that there is heaven and there is a hell and there is a judgment to come and justice will be done. It means that no evil will be swept under the rug. Praise God. And yet at the same time, there is fearful terror here. There is a judge who will account it all and that evil will either be laid to Jesus' account and thus be covered by his sacrificial death or it will fall on us. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that there is nothing more important for us to do than to receive the offer of forgiveness in repentance and faith in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the resurrection of Jesus Christ also means that your faith is precious. Sometimes we get complacent, don't we? It's much more precious than you realize, than I realize. Brothers and sisters, our faith in Jesus is precious. So guard it well. Exercise it courageously and share it boldly. Look with me. <laughs> this will get you thinking. Stew on this one. 1 Corinthians 15 is a chapter of resurrection apologetics written to Christians. Okay, I'll leave that for you to think about. But at the end of this majestic, triumphant defense of the resurrection of Jesus, Paul concludes with one line. The last verse in the chapter, read it with me. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Jesus' resurrection means your faith is precious. Guard it well. Exercise it courageously and share it freely. Now the last thing that Jesus' resurrection means is that there's another resurrection to come. These are weighty things. There is another resurrection to come in which all who belong to Christ through faith in him will follow in the everlasting and abundant life in which he already dwells. Let's go to the scripture again, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. There's a harvest coming. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that he will abolish is death. Later in the chapter, he describes what it will mean for us. It goes with me to verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown. What is sown? Our bodies. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. Well, life is inglorious sometimes, isn't it? And the end, Lewis called a stinking indignity. 
It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. And here, wonder of wonders, it is raised a spiritual body. Brothers and sisters, I have it on good authority. Good authority that all things are being made new. This is what is happening. This is what Jesus' resurrection confirms for us. All things are indeed being made new. All things will be new. Did you notice that he said all things? Not your best things. Not your finest moments. Not your achievements. Not your accomplishments. All things. Your weaknesses. Your frailties. Your infirmities. Your failures. All things will be made new. You know, there's this curious um, vignette that's recorded at the end of John's gospel. It's a guy by the name of Thomas. He has a nickname. You know what his name, nickname is? Doubting Thomas, right. Why did he get the nickname? There you go. Vocalized his doubts. <laughs> Everybody else was just quietly keeping them to themselves. So he gets to be called Doubting Thomas from now on. Um, <laughs> so there's Thomas, who, by the way, is a fine empiricist. I won't believe it till I can touch it. It might be true for you, but till I touch it, mm -mm. doesn't exist unless I can see it. Oh, really? So there's this curious event where Jesus comes to Thomas. After his resurrection, he says, hey, Thomas, can you, I want you to take your hands and I want you to feel right here. Put your hands here where they drove the nails through me. He says, Thomas, put your hand here in my side. Feel it. And you know, I read that and I think, oh, wait a minute. Jesus has been resurrected. What in the world is he doing with wounds? What was then sorrow has now been raised up as glory and joy. Brothers and sisters, all things will be made new. So full <laughs> will our life be so perfect our wholeness, so complete our joy in that day that all those old hurts will be remembered differently. Not as ends, but as means. We'll end with one of my favorites. C.S. Lewis describing the things that we're talking about. He describes them in this way. He says, this is the missing chapter in the story of the universe. The chapter on which the whole plot turns. That is why I believe that God really has dived down into the bottom of creation. And has come up bringing the whole redeemed nature on his shoulder. The miracles that have already happened are of course as scripture so often says. The first fruits of that cosmic summer which is presently coming on. Christ has risen. And so we shall rise. St. Peter, for a few seconds, walked on water. And the day will come when there will be a remade universe infinitely obedient to the will of glorified and obedient men. When we can do all things, when we shall be those glorified creatures that we are described as being in the scripture. To be sure, it feels wintry enough still. But often, in the very early spring, it feels like that. 2,000 years are only a day or two by this scale. 
a man really ought to say the resurrection happened 2,000 years ago in the same spirit in which he says, I saw a crocus, an early spring flower yesterday because we know what is coming behind the crocus. The spring comes slowly down this way, but the great thing is that the corner has been turned. There is, of course, this difference. That in the natural spring, the crocus cannot choose whether it will respond or not. We can. We have the power either of withstanding the spring and sinking back into the cosmic winter. Or of going on into those high midsummer pomps in which our leader, the Son of Man, already dwells into which he is calling us. It remains with us to follow or not. To die in this winter or to go on into that spring and into that summer. Brothers and sisters, we've remembered this story. I hope that we've reconsidered things and now it falls upon us to respond.